I thought perhaps you would like to know a little about me before we get going. I'm at the lower end of the page, which shows our family stretching back over almost 500 years in the same village. It has been a large family at times, and members of it in the past have travelled to various parts of the UK and as far as British Guiana in the late 19th century, where they were involved in working on and eventually the purpose of tonight's talk is to enlighten you a little about the bell hanging business which my great grandfather and grandfather operated and was started initially by one Thomas Ward Hooper. So this is the area of the family tree that we are concerned with tonight. You will see on the screen that our family survived three generations by producing only one male heir, including me, so you are very lucky that I am here at all. Other members of my great-grandfather's sibling group went off to places new. John went off to Herefordshire. William Mitchell went off to London to make his fortune and subsequently died in the Paddington Workhouse. And Alfred was listed as a tailor on the staff of the Nottingham Workhouse where he worked. However, we must press on. This is a story about two Thomases and two Harrys so I hope you don't get too confused. At the 1851 census, Thomas Ward Hooper, who we will call Thomas Hooper I, was living at Widden Down Post Office Inn, where his widowed mother was described as victualler. Thomas was then classed as a wheelwright with two indoor apprentices. By the next census in 1861, he had married a Woodbury girl, Caroline Lockyer who was registered as a lace maker, and he as a carpenter and headstone cutter, and they had a four-year-old son, Thomas II. They were recorded as living in Limstone Road, Woodbury. Where this is exactly, we're not sure, but it is known that in a destructive fire which started in Mr Hyatt's butcher shop in 1868, which spread across the road to destroy completely several thatch cottages, he lost his home and all his furniture, but luckily he was the only victim of the fire whose furniture was insured. In the 1881 census, Caroline was described as head of the household, as she was a widow and living alone in a house stroke grocer's shop, and described as a shopkeeper. By 1901 she was recorded as living in a house four doors away from her son in Pound Road, and you can see the pound on the right of the picture. When she died, or where she is buried, does not seem to be recorded in Woodbury information. Thomas I's first bell frame is reputed to have been built from Merton in West Devon in 1858, and could have been manufactured in Woodbury. Unfortunately, there is no absolute proof of this, but all the indicators are that this is the case, and it is backed up in John Scott's book, Towers and Bells of Devon. The Hooper family also had originated from the Jacobstow area, which is nearby. Widdendown, Merton and Jacobstow are of course not too distant from each other, and Thomas could have been headhunted for the job because of his reputation as a high-class carpenter. In hindsight, he must have been pretty good, as the frame still survives in good condition after 154 years. His second one at Otterdon in 1865 is more definite as there is a plaque on the wall to say so. This frame has now been there for 147 years and is still going strong, so there is a big gap of years in between where it is not recorded that he built any other frames. And this is the plaque, hand carved and gilded. In 1861 Thomas I was known to be working in Woodbury with John Stokes, the father of my great grandfather. John was classed as a sawyer and Thomas as a carpenter, so that would seem to be logical as the two trades obviously complemented each other. It seems quite clear now that young Harry would have probably tagged on to working at the family business, beginning to learn his trade. Whether he would have been classed as an apprentice I am not sure, but he subsequently became a skilled carpenter and builder and was obviously well known to Thomas Hooper as they would have all been working together. 
when Hooper went all the way to Alloa in Scotland to install a new frame and hang a peal of bells in 1871, young Harry, then aged about 22, was undoubtedly part of the team that went with him. How do I know this? Well, neither Thomas or Harry were registered on the 1871 census, something which has caused considerable investigation over the years by researchers, and the fact of the matter can only be that they were probably travelling up to Scotland, which would have taken several days back then, and were probably on a train. Census Day was April the 2nd, 1871 in England and Scotland, and the opening ceremony of the rehung bells was the 20th of April. So I think this could be a very logical conclusion. In the late 1860s, Hooper built up an association with the Birmingham Bell founders, William Blues and Sons, for whom both he and later Hooper and Stokes hung bells in various parts of the country. These were usually single, probably additional bells. Thomas Ward Hooper, Thomas I, died in late 1872 and is buried in Woodbury Churchyard, just to the right of the main path. His stone is difficult to read because of the algae, but the name Thomas Ward Hooper can be seen if you use your imagination. When Thomas Hooper I died at the age of 46 in late 1872, halfway through fitting a frame at Cheriton Bishop, it caused a few problems, and the job had to be finished by his widow Caroline and her young son Thomas II, then only 15 years old and classed as a bellhanger's apprentice. Young Harry Stokes also must have helped with this job, as inside one of the bells was chalked, rehung by H. Stokes and W. Tolman, Tolman was my great-grandfather's right-hand man. As I said previously, Thomas Ward Hooper lies buried in Woodbury Churchyard, though we have no records of the final resting place of Caroline or young Thomas later on. If anyone can throw any light on this, I would be interested to know. Following Thomas Senior's death, in 1873 the business was carried on as Hooper and Son by Caroline and teenage son Thomas with apparently my great-grandfather as an employee. A year or two later, a new name had arrived on the scene, and what was previously Hooper and Son was now Hooper and Stokes. This is the plaque at Powderham, where they installed the bells on a new frame in 1879, but by 1881 they had parted company. This is the Powderham Bells, which is a ring of six, still with its original frame. The reason for their parting company I do not know, but Caroline and Thomas continued trading as Hooper and Son on their own account, and only did sporadic bell jobs until their last one at Kenton in 1893. The frame for this is still in situ and looks as good as the day it was put in 120 years ago. However, it is believed that it may be constructed of pitch pine and not oak, but he left his name on the side, which is quite useful. I was lucky enough to have been taken around the bell chambers of both Powderham and Kenton by Mike Adams, the captain of the Ringers, who pointed out to me that these plans were the originals supplied by Hooper Jr. prior to the frame being installed. They had luckily been rescued from a local house, I believe during a change of ownership. Other than what I have told you already, I don't have any further information on the Hooper family and would welcome any knowledge or information that anyone in this area might have, especially any documents which could be scanned. Harry Stokes I, my great-grandfather, was born in 1848, so by the time that Hooper I died, he was only about 23 years old, as this picture probably shows. Nowadays this would seem quite young for a person to be taking control of a business. However, he obviously took the bull by the horns, and must have felt well qualified enough to move forward. Probably he didn't know any other job anyway. In 1881 he was living in the house of his elder sister in Woodbury with his wife Jane and young son Harry II, then aged three years old, who was my grandfather. He was later to follow in his father's footsteps 
and become a carpenter and bell hanger as well. As time went on, he gradually got older like the rest of us, as these two pictures show. In 1894, he became the first chairman of the newly formed Woodbury Parish Council, a post that he held for a year during the transition period. The bell hanging business was operated from this small building and yard in the main street of the village. It was still there until about two years ago, but was eventually demolished to make way for new housing. This was a bit of a shame, as the local history society had tried to buy it to turn it into a museum, but the last funds were not forthcoming quick enough. From this small premises, large objects were formed, as you can see in this picture. This is an oak bell frame built for St Michael's in East Tynmouth in 1897. I had hoped to go and see it in my travels, but alas it is no longer there. Luckily, reference to the internet saves many a journey to find out that things are no longer there. These frames were constructed after a previous visit where Harry would go and measure up the inside of the tower, so that the frames could be constructed to a somewhat rigid measurements. All this data and diagrams were handwritten in small pocket books, of which this is one. He would then send an estimate, which hopefully would be accepted. I have at home a book containing all the handwritten estimates that he wrote, all in longhand of course. After the oak frames were sawn and machined, drilled etc, they were always erected in the yard outside the building to make sure that everything fitted where it was supposed to, and most importantly that the outside measurements were spot on to the notes in his pocket book. Obviously he would not want to transport all this timber, hundreds of miles in some cases, and find that it would not fit when it got there. After dismantling it all again, it would be loaded on a wagon and taken to Woodbury Road Station, or maybe even Exeter, where it would be loaded on a train to go wherever. This is a picture of both my great-grandfather and grandfather sitting in the front, and their team of carpenters, smiths and bell hangers, taken in 1906. Members of this team would be sent to follow the train to the other end, and sub subsequently erect the frame in the appropriate tower and hang the bells. This could be to places all over the country, but the largest proportion of his work was in the West Country. In total, over the period, Hooper and Stokes did over 300 jobs for churches in the UK. All were not new frames, and many were just rehanging where the bells may have needed retuning, or perhaps needed new bearings on which to swing. I have here my grandfather's set of tuning forks, which still work very well. It would have been these which have, would have been used to see if the bell was a bit out of kilter and required attention. This was his business card, which he would have presented to the various vicars on arrival. I will show you the back of it later on. We now get a bit closer to home, and I can show you a picture of your own bells and Stokes frame, which was installed in 1905, and is still there. This picture was sent to me by Gordon Crook, who I think used to live here, but now resides in Exmouth. This frame has obviously done well for 107 years, but I gather that some attention is now needed, hence this get-together. When Gordon gave me the picture, I looked through the ledgers that I have to see if I could find the bill, and here it is. The whole job was done for £127, 3 and sixpence. That included lowering down the six bells, removing the old frame, providing a new oak frame, and rehanging the bells with new fittings. I'm afraid that I don't think you will get it done for this price next time. However, this seemed to be the price for the time, and was undoubtedly a lot of money back then. Today, of course, a hundred pounds is virtually nothing. Harry Stokes was also a ringer, and a founder member of the Devon Guild of Ringers, being member number 31 in 1874. This is something he maintained throughout his lifetime. This is a picture of the Woodbury Ringers in 1905, and for some reason he wasn't in the picture. Maybe he was away on a job. But they are a strong looking bunch, 
football in their Sunday best. In 1902, the bells at Limstone were installed in a new iron frame, which represented the first of such construction in Devonshire by a local bell hanger, and the press said the following. It supplied a substantial proof of a determination not to let the county to be behind in the matter of home provision of the most modern and scientific me methods of bell hanging. The contractor has been Mr. Harry Stokes of Woodbury and the neatness of the frame and the go of the bells evoke the highest expressions of approval, while the excellent matching of the new bell and the increased beauty of the peel excited general admiration. And this is the limestone bell frame that still survives to today. Seen in the picture here is a similar one being prepared in the Woodbury workshop for St Michael Carehays in Cornwall. It is believed that the castings for the frames were made by Garton and King or Parkins of Exeter, both of whom were in the foundry business. I am aware of our family's long relationship with Parkins, but unfortunately do not have any documentary evidence in relation to the bells. Each frame would probably have to be a one-off, as all the towers were different sizes. You will note the name of the bell hanger put into the casting. This was to prove useful later on. The bells themselves were not cast locally, and as I said at the beginning, some were cast in Birmingham by William Blues. In more recent years, the bells were cast in London by Mears and Stainbank, now the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. This is where I come in, as my father, the son of Harry Stokes II, and also called Harry, <laughs> married Kathleen Hughes, the daughter of Albert Hughes, who was then the proprietor of Mears and Stainbank. In due course, therefore, I was cast, and here I am, some 70 years later, still as good as new, or more or less. The Whitechapel Bell Foundry is still going, of course, and is now under the ownership of my cousin, Alan Hughes. On the subject of as good as new, this next picture shows the same frame as in the previous slide, some 98 years later. While driving in Cornwall some years ago, we passed a signpost pointing to St Michael Carehays, and I said to my wife, we had better go and take a look to see if the frame was still there. And so it was, as can be verified by the name in the casting. And the bill for it is shown here. This was slightly more than the cruise mortured bill, but of course it was nine years later. This is two-thirds of the original estimate for the job which as you can see is all written in longhand and very detailed. This next slide shows a similar iron frame in the Woodby workshop being pieced together before dispatch to Buckland Monocorum. This is one of the photos that I have showing my great grandfather outside a church somewhere with three bells obviously in the process of being rehung. This is another picture which shows the performance of getting a bell to and from a church. Firstly they needed a good wagon on which the bell could ride to and from the nearest station. As some of these bells could be upwards of a ton, it needed to be strong as well. The bell had to be loaded and unloaded by chain and tackle using a timber tripod and plenty of hands were needed to make sure that it all went well. Once offloaded, the bell then had to be moved into the base of the tower and then hoisted perhaps 50 or 60 feet up into the bell chamber and fixed accordingly to the frame. This must have been an extremely delicate operation and disaster could have struck at any time. This is my grandfather on the right, whom I knew very well of course, as he didn't die until 1963. With him is Tolman, his foreman. Tolman always seemed to wear a bowler hat wherever he went. As an aside to the bell business, I thought you might like to see what my grandfather did on his wedding day in 1905. He was married on November the 1st, which is almost 107 years to the day from where we are now. The interesting thing to me is the cost of his wedding reception at the Globe Inn at Woodbury. As you can see on the right, the assembled guests were all pretty prolific smokers, 
getting through 22 and a half ounces of Topsham mixture tobacco, 14 and a half ounces of shag tobacco, 52 cigars, that's nearly two each, and 26 cigarettes. Dinner for 33 people costs three pounds 14 and eight pence, which is less than half it would cost to buy fish and chips for one today. The total for all this being five pounds 13 and tuppence. Whilst I appreciate that all costs are relative, this to me seems quite outstanding. This is just another bill that I've put in, which shows the basic costs of having your bells taken down and put up again on a new frame during this period would cost somewhere between 90 to 160 pounds, depending on the number of bells. I doubt when you do yours, you will get it done for this. <coughs> of course, there were no telephones back in the 1880s, and the main method of communications was by postcard. This is the back of one which reads, Shall expect you over Monday the 14th by 10.35 train at Hallwell Junction. A trap will be at the station. I also have many letters of testimonial for the work that the Stokes team did back then. This is one in 1883 and signed by Mark Roll. Earlier I told you that I would show you the back of Harry Stokes' business card. Here you can see that he travelled to York Minster and fitted an Elecum chiming apparatus to the 12 bells there. Apart from the distance being a major hike from Woodbury in those days, it was obviously a prestigious job and, and his success was written up in the press for all to see. This really must have been a good advertisement for him. <coughs> I'm sure that many of you here will know what an Elecum chiming apparatus is, but for those who don't I will explain. The Reverend Ellicombe, who was the incumbent at Clisson George, the next village to Woodbury, played quite a part in the bell scene of the period. Apart from being a studious fellow, he was a botanist of distinction, and was said to have 3,000 plants in the rectory garden at Clisson George, all of which he could identify individually. He was also a noted campanologist, and in his old age visited every bell tower in Devon, apart from one from which he was turned away because he was thought to be a tramp. However, he was far more than that and had earlier invented a system of chimes so that the bells could be rung single-handed after he had banned the regular bell ringers from his belfry at his previous parish for being drunk on duty. These were known as the Elecum chimes and the Hooper and Stokes team fitted these in no less than 24 churches from 1872 in Suffolk until 1904 in Tresillian in Cornwall, including Woodbury probably, during the refit of 1897. The system was that an extra clapper was fixed to the bell frame, one for each bell, and via a series of ropes brought down to the base of the tower, the bells could effectively be chimed by one person, as you can see here. The more bells, the more ropes. As is now, there seemed to be people living in the vicinity of churches who disliked hearing the bells ringing on practice nights in particular, so another system evolved to try to combat this. This is called Sieges Apparatus, and used in a totally different concept. 
It was devised by one Ephraphus Siege, an Exeter printing engineer, and first installed in about 1875 at St Sidwell's Church in the city. Firstly, the bell clappers had to be tied to one side of the bells so that they could not move. Based on the principle of a shopkeeper's doorbell, the siege apparatus was a trip mechanism activated by the tower bell in its swing. A roller at the top of the headstock on the side opposite to the bell struck a U-shaped rocker arm as the bell was rising to the balance. A spike at the bottom of the rocker arm operated a cam on the top of a trip lever, depressing the end of the lever which in turn was attached to a sprung wire and crank. When the lever was depressed, the wire was jerked and the little bell in the ringing chamber was struck. There was one fitting for each tower bell, and the small bells in the ringing chamber would have been tuned to the same note as the tower bell. This, of course, was then silent to the outside world, and ringers could ring to their heart's content. However, this equipment was reported to be high maintenance at the time, and it is doubtful if there are any left in working order. The nearest one to here was installed at St Peter's in Tiverton, to the best of my knowledge. The Stokes team is only credited with installing one of these pieces of equipment at Tewton Mendip in Somerset in 1880. They were sometimes known as dumbbells. This is a diagram to show you how roughly how it worked. Firstly the clapper had to be tied against the bell in a fixed position as I said and a striker fitted to the headstock of the bell. This would strike the rocker arm both sides of the swing. This would then hit a trip mechanism which would activate a wire to the bell striker in the ringing chamber. It was quite a complicated system and it is easy to see why it had a high maintenance factor. There were so many bits which could break or get out of kilter. During the time of both Hooper and Stokes, they filled in their time between bell jobs with local carpentry work and building. Hooper was a qualified wheelwright way back in the 1860s, so he could probably turn his hand to anything. The two Harry's Stokeses were equally qualified, and records exist of many of the other local jobs that they did. They were quality carpenters, wheelwrights, blacksmiths and undertakers. They could make virtually anything, and indeed refitted the whole of the seating in Woodbury Church in 1913 for £245.16 and, shillings. and uh, the estimate and the bill are shown here. They also constructed a new lich gate for Woodbury Church in 1903 and the bill for that was £58.18. And shillings. This replaced a previous lich gate and was erected as a memorial to a member of, a, of the local Fulford family one of whom was killed in the Boer War. The Fulford family paid the bill for this, and it still stands today. It was paid on the 9th of January 1903, exactly 39 years before I was born. On the funeral side, they could supply whatever you wanted. You could have a basic funeral coffin with no frills for £3.13 shillings, Include, including all vicar's fees, etc. If you wanted to be slightly more comfortable in your last resting place, this would cost you £12.10, and 10 shillings. but this would give you some frills and a pitch pine outer coffin with a polished wooden cross, plus an eight foot deep grave and all funeral costs. At the other extreme, it is noted that many infants died due to various diseases, and the funeral costs for these amounted to 10 shillings. However, times were so hard that many of these had to be paid for in instalments over a long period, which is difficult to imagine now. After Harry Stokes I first died in 1912, son Harry carried on alone with the business until 1918, when he, when he had a sale of most of his business equipment. This is because, as it says in the advert, he was called to the colours. Being a skilled craftsman, he was seconded to the Royal Air Force, 
and, commu and commuted to Wormwood Scrubs Naval Airship Station in London for a period, where he was employed as far as we can ascertain, making wooden frames for certain types of airship. This must have been a very secret job, as we have no records or information of what he actually did, although we have information as to where he lodged and some of his travel passes. But that is all. Unfortunately, I never knew anything about this until after my own father died and we were sorting out its effects. And I wish I had been able to ask him some questions about this before his death. At some stage he returned to Woodbury and continued the bell business by mainly doing servicing work in towers rather than installing new frames. He was probably operating a bit more single-handed during this period. His son, my father, also Harry, had no interest in the bell business and had a great desire to be a farmer. Weber's farm, a roll estate farm in the village, came up for tender in 1932 and my father showed a great interest in taking the tenancy. This was in a quite depressed period, a bit like now. Grandfather went along to the roll estate office and said to the agent, My son would like this farm, as simple as that and he was granted the tenancy, which he, then I, held until the mid-1990s. I don't think you would get to, into a farm quite as easily now. The year after this, my grandfather must have decided that he had had enough of the bell business and finally sold up all his remaining equipment and joined his son in partnership on the farm. There were still some interesting items from the main carpentry bell business in this sale, including a lot of coffin-making components, wagons, shafts, lades, plus a couple hundred yards of hoisting ropes up to five inches in diameter. These must have taken quite a bit of handling. Both my grandfather and father were all, always keen to try to modernise farming, and one of their concoctions was a semi-automatic potato planter, which was pulled directly behind the plough. The two chaps on the trailer would pop seed potatoes down the chute directly into the furrow behind the plough, which I have faint visions of in my youth. It was sort of successful, and perhaps the forerunner of today's one-pass cultivations. Who knows? It probably saved a bit of backache anyway. Grandfather's carpentry skills were also used in the manufacture of fold units for the growing flock of laying hens during the late 40s and through the 50s. He made all of these one by one, and I remember being his apprentice until I caught a nail with his treasured wood plane, which didn't do it a lot of good. I was then given my marching orders. Thomas Hooper started off as a simple carpenter and then moved on to bigger things like bell frames, whilst my grandfather did it in reverse order and eventually got back to an easier life. This brings my story to an end, with an epilogue by the Woodbury Ringers, and the bells ring out over the village, which they have done for centuries. This is a tradition which must never cease, despite the fact that there are currently many attempts to curtail ringing in various places, including our own village, where, e where even the clock chimes have been under threat. However, that is another story. Thank you.